Welcome to your NCFE Level 2, Certificate in Creating a Business Startup, Session 3 of 4, Legal and Financial Considerations for a Business Startup, brought to you on behalf of Poplar Harker and Solutions Equinox. My name is Phil Church and I shall be your narrator and guide for this session. This NCFE Level 2 Online Certificate in Creating a Business Startup has been brought to you by Poplar Harker and Solutions Equinox for online learning. Visit and subscribe our YouTube channel for more learning videos. The unit being covered in this session is legal and financial considerations for a business startup. Your learning journey so far. Session 1 covered initial steps for a business startup. Followed by session 2, marketing for a business startup with online tutor support sessions. You would have had enough to complete your online assessment one on your ePortfolio, uploading any relevant tasks and material. This session, Legal and Financial Considerations for a Business Startup, will be followed by online tutor support sessions. In the final session, Developing a Business Plan. Again, with tutor support sessions, you will have enough after session four to complete your online assessment two on your ePortfolio, uploading any relevant tasks or material. There'll be four tutor support throughout the whole program. Once completed and it's been assessed and internally and externally quality assured, you'll be awarded your qualification. Completing your assignments. It is important to understand the action verbs in the assignment questions. The action verbs define. Your answer must give the precise meaning of a word. Describe. In order to describe something, you must give a detailed account of it. Explain. You need to ensure that your answer is clear, revealing relevant facts. Identify. Point out and explain. Don't just make a list. Your answer should establish who or what something is. We will tutor you throughout the programme and help you to complete the two assignments. Once you submit your assignments online, they will be assessed. All your completed assignments will then be submitted for internal and external quality assurance. And once this process is complete, you'll be awarded your qualification. Our remote assistance service, we can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com. And as previously stated, your emails must be marked with NCFE Business Startup. Completing your assignments and accompanying tasks. In addition to completing your two assessment booklets, you also need to complete associated tasks. To complete all your coursework successfully, it is vital that you use the associated handbooks. The PDF handbooks can be accessed through the ePortfolio system. And you will be directed in the videos to the handbook page numbers that relate to the assessment questions. You must upload the associated tasks onto your ePortfolio for assessment. In this section, you will understand HMRC and tax requirements. And by the end of this section, you will be able to describe self-employed and corporation tax requirements. 
identify the information and process required to register with HMRC. Describe the consequences of not complying with HMRC and tax requirements. And identify VAT rates and conditions. Requirements to pay tax and submit tax returns for the self-employed. If you are self-employed, you will be taxed on the profits of the business. For those in partnership, they will be taxed on their share of the profits as set out in the partnership agreement. Taxable profits are calculated by deducting business costs and expenses from business revenue. The cost of assets used in the business is not treated as an expense but an allowance is made which effectively deducts part of the asset cost from the profits for each year of its use in the business. For individuals, there is a personal tax-free allowance which is deducted from the profits before calculating tax. Income tax and NIC contributions will then be calculated on the remaining amount at the current rates set out by the government. Tax rates are on a scale depending on how much income an individual receives, for income over a specified amount, you will pay tax at higher rates. National insurance contributions are payments that entitle individuals to a state old age pension and benefits should they become ill, disabled or unemployed. NIC is paid on earnings over a specified level set out by the government. Companies Taxable profits for limited companies are calculated in the same way as for unincorporated businesses. Business expenses are deducted from business income. However, it is the company that is liable for the tax and they pay corporation tax at the set rate. There is no tax-free allowance for companies, but sometimes the government introduces higher rates for companies making higher profits. Why not do some more research on the HMRC website? Your assignment question is requiring you for question one to describe the requirements to pay tax and submit tax returns for self-employed and companies. Further reading can be found in your Qualification Handbook, pages 4 to 7, or use the internet for further research. Information and processes required to register with HMRC. Sole Trader If you are a sole trader, you should register for self-assessment you must register no later than 5th of October in the second tax year of your business. The tax year runs from 6th of April to 5th of April the following year. You can register online and HMRC will set up an account for self-assessment and send you a unique taxpayer reference or UTR, which will be used to identify your tax account. To register, you will need to give your name, trading name and contact details as well as information about when you started to trade, the nature of the business and your national insurance number. Partnership. If you are in a partnership, a nominated partner must register as the person responsible for sending the partnership tax return. The partnership must be registered no later than the 5th of October in the second tax year of your business. The partnership will be given a unique tax reference but individual partners must also register separately for self-assessment. To register, you will need to provide details about you as well as information about the trading partnership and whether you are the nominated partner. Limited company. Limited companies must register with Companies House and using the online system, may register for corporation tax at the same time. If they don't do this, they must register with HMRC within three months of starting to operate the business. Companies will be sent a UTR 14 days after registering through Companies House or can request one online through HMRC. 
Information to be provided will include the company name, registered office, correspondence address and registration number, names and home addresses of directors, the date the company started to trade and the nature of the business. If you register at the same time as registering the company, these details will be submitted to HMRC automatically. Why not do some more research on the HMRC website? Your assignment question is asking you for question two. For one form of business structure, either sole trader, partnership or private limited company, identify the information and process required to register with HMRC. You may choose the format you intend to use for your own startup and provide copies of completed information. You could identify a step-by-step -step process and identify what information is needed to complete the process and this could be evidenced by screenshot. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook, pages 8 to 9, or use the internet for further research. Consequences of not complying with HMRC and tax requirements. Tax evasion. Tax evasion is not paying taxes that are due to HMRC. This may mean not reporting taxes, deliberately reporting incorrect profits, or not paying taxes owed. Tax evasion is a criminal offence in the United Kingdom, and the maximum penalties are unlimited fines and life imprisonment. In practice, the penalties would be related to the severity of the offence. Tax avoidance. Tax avoidance is the operation of a policy or scheme which seeks to reduce or avoid tax liability. An example might be a director taking money from the company as a loan rather than a salary, thereby avoiding income tax. Another example is registering companies outside the UK to avoid UK tax legislation. Tax avoidance is not illegal, but takes advantage of loopholes in the tax system. HMRC tried to block loopholes. The loan example here, for example, is now usually illegal and HMRC are looking at measures to target offshore tax avoidance schemes. There may not be any consequences from tax avoidance, but businesses that use such schemes will need to ensure they remain compliant as HMRC block the legal loopholes and they may also come under scrutiny from HMRC if it is believed they may be evading tax or not complying with tax requirements. Non-compliance. Whilst stories of tax evasion and tax avoidance schemes are frequently in the news, most people incurring penalties in relation to tax do so for non-compliance with the rules. Penalties may be imposed from a range of different reasons. Failing to register for tax. You can be fined for late filing of tax returns. Amounts will depend on how long you have been trading, the amount of tax owed and whether the failure was due to the carelessness or was it deliberate. You will also be charged tax penalties for late payment of tax and interest on tax due and may be fined for failing to keep proper records. Failing to submit a return. If you do not submit a return on time, you will be fined £100 and charged tax on the amount due. The fine increases when the return is more than three months late. Failure to keep records and complete tax returns correctly, the HMRC may carry out checks on businesses to see whether they are keeping records correctly. Usually this will be a telephone check, but if they believe there is a problem, they may visit the business. Businesses can be fined up to £3,000 for failing to keep adequate business records. They may also face penalties and interest on tax amounts that have been underpaid. Late payment of tax. HMRC charges interest on late payment of tax based on the amounts due. If the tax is left outstanding, HMRC can take your possessions to sell at auction to pay the tax or take money from your bank account. They may take court action, in which case court costs will also be incurred and in extreme cases may force you into bankruptcy. 
A refusal to pay tax in the long term is tax evasion and could attract fines and a prison sentence. There have been a number of high case profiles of celebrities and companies that have found themselves in their headlines for tax avoidance and tax evasion and the ethical and legal implications of companies such as Amazon and Starbucks remain echoing in the news. But ultimately, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs will always get their money. Your assignment question is asking you for question three to describe the consequences of not complying with HMRC and tax requirements in relation to tax evasion, tax avoidance and non-compliance. And you could research cases of tax evasion and the consequences. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook on pages 10 to 12 or use the internet for further research. Conditions for businesses to register for BAT. The conditions for businesses to register for BAT. All businesses must register for VAT when the business turnover goes over the VAT threshold for a year set by HMRC, or if they expect the turnover will be over the threshold in the next 30 days. You can register the business for VAT through the online HMRC services, Learners should identify the current threshold for VAT and you can find that on the government websites. Current VAT rates. The standard rate is 20% and reduced rate 5% for 2019 to 2020. So establish what the current VAT threshold is for businesses. Your assignment question is asking you for question four to identify the conditions for businesses to register for VAT and current VAT rates. Don't just list them, explain them as well, please. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook on pages 12 to 14 or use the internet for research. In this section, you will understand legislation for the business startup. By the end of this section, you will be able to explain the requirements of employment legislation for the business startup, explain the requirements of health and safety legislation for the business startup, explain the requirements of data protection legislation for the business startup, and explain the requirements of digital and copyright legislation for the business startup. Requirements of employment legislation for your business startup. Checking that employees have the right to work in the UK, you should check their ID, for example, a driving license or a passport. And if they are a foreign national, check that they have the correct visa allowing them to work in the UK. You should keep copies of any documents that you check. Providing a written statement on the terms of employment. For employees who will be working for longer than one month, this should be provided within two months of the start of their employment. Note that an employment contract exists whether or not there is any agreement in writing. A contract starts when the employee accepts an unconditional offer of employment. Only change in terms of employment if you have reserved the right to do so. In a written agreement, or within the agreement of the employee. If changes are made, these should be in writing. Paying employees at least the minimum wage, which is set out by the government according to their age. You can find out more about the minimum wage at the Government National Minimum Wage Rates website. 
They may also be entitled to sick pay when they are ill, maternity pay when pregnant, paternity pay, paternal leave, including maternity, paternity and adoption leave, and 28 days holiday per year if they are full-time or the part-time equivalent for part-time workers. Registering as an employer for tax purposes. Before paying employees for the first time, employers must operate as a pay-as-you-earn or PAYE system for employees, which means they must deduct tax and national insurance payments from the money paid to an employee and pay it to HMRC. Amounts are reported and paid to HMRC on a monthly basis, and you can find out more about PAYE here at the Government Business Tax Pay website. Providing a workplace pension scheme to which all employees are enrolled and contributing to that pension scheme, unless they wish to withdraw. Providing written disciplinary rules and procedures. These will generally be in line with the ACAS Code of Practice. ACAS is the Advisory, Conciliation and Arbitration Service which provides advice and guidance on employment matters. The Code of Practice can be found at their website. Employees cannot simply be dismissed without proper procedures being followed or else they could claim for unfair dismissal. Ensuring working hours are in line with Working Time Directive which states that the working week should be a maximum of 48 hours. Employees may opt out of this and work longer hours if they wish. Protecting employees from discrimination in line with the Equality Act 2010 on the grounds of age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief sex and sexual orientation. These factors must not affect pay, promotion, access to training or any aspect of employment. Your assignment question is asking you for question 5 to explain the requirements of employment legislation for the business startup. And you could research the most up to date legislation that may affect your business startup or your potential future growth. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook on pages 15 to 16 or use the internet for research. Health and safety legislation requirements for your business startup. These are the main steps you need to take to comply with health and safety legislation and regulations. Appoint a competent health and safety person for the business. You need to appoint someone who can manage health and safety for your business. This could be yourself or an employee or, where health and safety is more complex, a specialist advisor who could be external to the business. This person will be responsible for ensuring that the business complies with health and safety regulations and for dealing with health and safety issues. Develop a health and safety policy for your business. If you have fewer than five employees, there is no legal requirement to write down your health and safety policy, though you should still develop one, but it makes sense to do so. A health and safety policy sets out who has responsibility for health and safety issues, making arrangements to prevent accidents or illness, providing instructions and training for employees, maintaining safe and healthy work conditions and managing emergency situations. You can see a sample of health and safety policy at their government website at hsc.gov.uk. Carry out a risk assessment and put suitable controls in place to manage risks. You need to identify hazards, describe the risks that arise from those hazards and decide who could potentially be harmed and take actions that will control the risks. The risk assessment should show that you have taken action to protect people as far as reasonably practicable. 
talk to employees about health and safety. This is to explain what has been done and to encourage them to raise any health and safety concerns. Provide training and information to employees. Employees should be trained in health and safety issues. For example, how to use protective equipment and how to carry out activities safely. They should also be provided with clear instructions. Provide welfare facilities. These include toilets, washing facilities and somewhere to eat meals and take breaks. The workplace should also be healthy with adequate heating, lighting and ventilation and suitable workplace spaces. Make arrangements for accidents and emergencies. You should have a stock first aid box and an appointed first aider. You should keep an accident book to record accidents and injuries along with any first aid or other treatment required. You should have procedures in place that employees can follow in emergencies, including instructions for evacuating business premises in case of a fire or other emergency. Fire exits and fire equipment should be clearly marked. Display the health and safety law poster published by the health and safety executive or provide each employee with the health and safety law leaflet. This sets out the employer and employee responsibilities in relation to health and safety. Your assignment question is asking you to explain the requirements of health and safety for your business startup. Further reading can be found in your qualification handbook on pages 17 to 18 or use the internet for further research. Requirements of data protection legislation for your business startup. Data protection legislation and regulations control the way that businesses collect and use personal data. The Data Protection Act 2018 and the European General Data Protection Regulations, the GDPR, set out how businesses should manage and control personal data. Personal data is data that relates to an identified or identifiable individual. This could be a name and address, or a number used to identify a person, for example, a staff number on an employment record, any information linked to that name or number will be personal data. You first need to decide whether you are a data controller or a data processor. A data controller has control over personal data and decides how it will be processed. They will make decisions about what data to collect and what to do with it. Data processors simply process data on behalf of others. Businesses that are data controllers will have to register with the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, unless they only use personal data to administer payroll and sales and purchase invoices. If you, for example, carry out any direct mailing activities where you try to sell to people by sending paper mail or email, then you would need to be registered. You can find out whether you need to register your business by completing the ICO questionnaire. Your assignment question is asking you for question 7 to explain the requirements of data protection legislation for your business startup. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook, pages 21 to 22, or use the internet for further research. Requirements of digital and copyright legislation for your business startup. Copyright. The Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988 covers the use of intellectual property in the UK. If you want to use any protected material, you should seek the permission of the owner. You may be able to use some material without infringing copyright, as long as it is not a substantial part of the work but it can sometimes be difficult to establish what this means. 
If a significant or valuable part of a design or piece of work is used, this may be considered substantial, even though it is only a small percentage of the item. Examples of infringement include the use of a trademark without permission, copying a patented design feature, playing music on a website without permission, using images in business documentation without permission, using text from a website or printed publication without permission. A short quote will usually be OK. Penalties for infringement include legal action by the owner of the intellectual property, damages awarded by the court to the owner of the intellectual property, usually based on the gains made by the business and losses made by the owner, damage to reputation of the business. With regard to copyright, businesses may be able to purchase a license allowing them to copy and share some copyrighted works if they need to do this on a regular basis. The Copyright Licensing Agency provides licenses to businesses. Digital Law The law in this area is quite complex, as in many cases the law has not kept pace with technology and the laws used to prosecute offences may not specifically relate to technology. For example, stealing someone's identity electronically would be a fraud rather than necessarily a specific digital offence. However, it is relatively straightforward to set out the areas where businesses need to be careful with digital technology. Infringements include illegal file sharing, where protected digital material, which could be text, images, film or audio, is illegally shared. This could mean it was offered for download or posted on a site such as YouTube, where others may view it without permission of the owner. Creating viruses. These are software programs that may harm computers or destroy information, and they can be sent through emails or directly loaded to computers. Hacking. Breaking into computer systems without authorised access, often to gain information illegally or to create damage in a system. Identity theft. Pretending to be someone else online to gain access to money through loans or their bank account or to access other benefits. Businesses need to identify risks on their own systems and ensure that they are and their employees do not commit any of the above acts. There are serious penalties for digital infringements including large fines, payment of damages and imprisonment. Your assignment question is asking you for question 8 to explain the requirements of digital and copyright legislation for your business startup. Further reading can be found in your qualification handbook on pages 23 to 25 or use the internet for research. In this section, you will understand cash profit and cash flow and by the end of this section you will be able to differentiate between cash, turnover and profit, describe the structure of a cash flow forecast, produce a complete cash flow forecast for your business startup, assess the cash flow for the business startup. Structure of a cash flow forecast A cash flow forecast sets out all the amounts expected to come into the business and to go out of the business. This is usually structured as a month by month summary for the first 6 or 12 months of the business. Amounts are entered in the months they are actually expected to be received or paid. This way the business owner can see how much money will be available at the end of each month. Producing a completed cash flow forecast for your business startup. You are required to prepare your own cash flow forecast relating to your business. Information on how to do this is contained within your course workbook. It should include estimated receipts, 
estimated payments and estimated balances for six months of a year. Why not do some further research on cash flow forecasts? Your assignment question is asking you for question 9 to describe the structure of a cash flow forecast and question 10 is asking you to produce a completed cash flow forecast for your business startup and don't forget to include this with your assessment in the ePortfolio. We have a template in the ePortfolio for you to use or you can source one online. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook pages 25 to 30 or use the internet for further research. Assessing the cash flow for your business startup as prepared for question 10. Positive factors and their implications. You need to assess the positive factors for your cash flow and the implications of these. These may include having surplus cash which may mean you can bring forward purchases or pay yourselves a higher wage, for example. Negative factors and their implications. You need to assess the negative factors for your own cash flow and the implications of these. These may include not having sufficient funds to pay bills, which may mean you need to borrow money or make arrangements to pay suppliers later, for example. Your assignment question is asking you for question 11 to assess the cash flow for your business startup as prepared for question 10 and use the cash flow template that you have populated in question 10. You must consider both positive and negative aspects. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook pages 31 to 33 or use the internet for further research. Differentiating between cash, turnover and profit. Turnover. The turnover of a business is the amount of money taken in a particular period. It is also referred to sometimes as sales or revenue. Cash. The way we are using the term cash here is to refer to the cash and cash equivalents that come in and are paid out of the business. Cash flow is the movement of cash through the business. Cash held by the business is the difference between the cash received and the cash paid out. Profit. Profit is the amount of surplus that the business makes. It is the amount of turnover less the amount of expenses relevant to a specific period. The amount of profit differs from the amount of cash a business has because profit takes account of all the revenues and expenses relevant to a period whether or not they have actually been paid. Why not do some further research on cash, turnover and profit? Your assignment question is asking you for question 12 to differentiate between cash, turnover and profit. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook pages 31 to 33 or use the internet for further research. In this section, you will understand management of customers and suppliers, and by the end of this section, you will be able to identify customer and supplier information required for the business startup, explain the importance of accurate invoices and payment receipts, Produce an invoice and payment receipt template for a business startup. And describe options for making and receiving payments. Information required by your business startup about customers and suppliers. Customers. Information may include their names, 
Contact details. Details to receive payment, for example, debit card details. Information about goods or services supplied. Records of contact made with the customer. Suppliers. Information may include their names, their contact details. Details to make payment, for example, bank account details. Information about goods or services purchased. Price lists. And records of contacts made with the supplier. Your assignment question is asking you for question 13. Identify information required for your business startup about customers and suppliers. So you should also consider payment information and supplier contact information. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook pages 34 to 35 or use the internet for further research. Importance of accurate invoices and payment receipts. It is important that any invoices and payment receipts for a business are accurate. An invoice is a bill for payment that lists the goods and services along with how much needs to be paid. A business may send invoices to customers where customers buy goods or services but don't pay for them straight away. A business will receive invoices from suppliers when they buy goods or services and don't pay for them straight away. A payment receipt is a document that shows the payment that has been made. You receive a payment receipt when you buy something from a shop, for example. Most often they are printed automatically through the till. They may list what you have purchased and give details of the amount paid and usually how it was paid, for example by cash or card. Businesses may issue these to their customers and may receive them for goods and services they have purchased from other businesses. Invoices and payment receipts form part of the accounting records of the business and should be retained by the business. If invoices and payment receipts are not accurate, then the business records may not be accurate and the business may not make or receive the correct payments for goods or services or may not make or receive payments at the right time. Not keeping accurate records will also cause difficulties when it comes to filing a tax return. Here is an example of a company that failed due to poor financial controls. The BBC reported in 2018, where did it go wrong for Carillion? Construction giant Carillion is going into liquidation after its huge financial troubles finally overwhelmed it. The UK's second largest construction company buckled under the weight of a whopping £1.5 billion debt pile. Despite discussions between Carillion, its lenders and the government, no deal could be reached to save the company. The big concern is over the disruption that this might cause given Carillion holds so many government contracts from building hospitals to managing schools. It also employs about 20,000 people in the UK and has more staff abroad. So how did the company get into such dire straits? But what does Carillion do? Carillion specialises in construction as well as facilities management and ongoing maintenance. It has worked on big private sector projects such as the Battersea Power Station redevelopment and the Anfield Stadium expansion but is perhaps best known for being one of the largest suppliers of services to the public sector. As you can see, Carillion's share price collapsed since July 2017, from being just short of 250 pence sterling to liquidation in January 2018. How big is it? Very. Carillion employs 43,000 staff globally, around half of them in the UK where it does most of its business. It also operates in Canada, the Middle East and the Caribbean. In 2016 it had sales of £5.2 billion and until July boasted a market capitalisation of almost £1 billion. But since then its share price has plummeted, leaving it worth 
just £61 million. What went wrong for the firm? Some argue that it overreached itself, taking on too many risky contracts that proved unprofitable. It also faced payment delays in the Middle East that hid its accounts. Last year, it issued three profit warnings in five months and wrote down more than £1 billion from the value of its contracts, and this made it much harder to manage its mountainous £900 million debt pile and £600 million pension deficit. And as you can see, our Carillion's debt, with its average net borrowing, grew since 2010 to over, over £800 million in 2017. And that's estimated. In December, the firm convinced lenders to give it more time to repay them. However, the company's banks, which included Santander UK, HSBC and Barclays, were reluctant to lend it any more cash. What were Carillion's biggest setbacks? Well, among its biggest problems were most cost overruns on three public sector construction contracts. The £350 million Midland Metropolitan Hospital in Sandwell. The opening was originally scheduled for October 2018, but difficulties with the heating, lighting and ventilation system forced a delay of the launch date to spring 2019. The £335 million Royal Liverpool Hospital. The new 646-bed hospital was due to be finished by March 2017, but the completion date has been repeatedly pushed back and reports, amid reports of cracks in the building. The £745 million Aberdeen Bypass, which is being built by the Aberdeen Roads Limited Consortium, a joint venture that includes Balfour Beatty and Morrison Construction alongside Carillion. It is due to open in spring 2018. One King Stretch was due to open a year earlier, but was delayed because of slow progress in completing initial earthworks. Last month, Environment Watchdog slapped a £280,000 penalty on the consortium for polluting two of Scotland's most important salmon rivers. Or why does the collapse matter? As Carillion is such a big supplier to the public sector, some fear that there will be a lot of disruption. Labour MP John Trickett told Parliament before the announcement that if it went under, it would risk massive damage to a range of public services. Thousands of jobs also hang in the balance. Unions have said do not deserve to be caught. The workers do not deserve to be caught in the crossfire and have urged the government to safeguard their jobs and bring Carillion's contracts back in house. The government, which has praised Carillion's work on projects such as Crossrail, has said that it will provide funding to maintain the public services run by the firm. Analysts say that Carillion had a large order book of business lined up. The big question is, who will ultimately pick up its loss making public contracts, another outsourced provider or the government itself? MPs have called for a full structural breakup of the big four accountancy firms, such as KPMG, following the collapse of the Carillion in a new report. They're gunning for the big four accountancy companies with a view to breaking them up. And this was because they were audited by one of them and they were repeatedly signed off for their accounts, despite the profit warnings and massive loss and, and failings echoing throughout. And that was KPMG. Your assignment question is asking you for question 14 to explain the importance of accurate invoices and payment receipts and contextualise it to your business startup. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook pages 34 to 35 or use the internet for further research. Producing an invoice and payment receipt template for your business startup. You are required to produce an invoice template and payment receipt template. Typically, an invoice will contain the following information. Name and address of the business, the telephone number and email. For limited companies, the registered company number and registered address should be included. 
name and address of the customer to make sure the invoice reaches the right person. Invoice reference or number so that the invoices are not duplicated or mixed up. Date the goods or services were supplied and the date the invoice was prepared. Details of the goods or services supplied and their cost. Amount of VAT charged and the VAT receipt where this is relevant. Total amount to be paid. Payment terms, for example, payments must be made within 30 days. And details of how to make payment, for example, bank account details so direct payment can be made to the bank and this would include the bank name, account holder name, account name, number and sort code. VAT invoices must also include the business's VAT registration number. Information to be included on a payment receipt includes the date and time of the purchase, items purchased and price paid, name and address of the business, any VAT charged and method of payment. And here is an example of one of our invoices. Invoices can either be sent out via email or using an accounting system such as Xero or QuickBooks. As you can see, ours is logoed, has the invoice number, can generate an area for a purchase order number, the bank details or any other forms of methods of payment can be exhibited on this. And as you can see, we have our contact details and any area that we can record the items and services used and our registration number. We also include our terms and conditions. Our terms and conditions you can view on our website. And this includes on there, their obligations and the services that we will provide to them and the obligations to us to payment and the fees for the services that are set out in the quotations or within the invoice and how they can cancel and amend any of the work that needs to be done for us. And our payment terms are also located on that as part of the clauses. And we have actually had to quote the clauses to some companies in the past who have failed to pay their invoices. And we have a clause written in there that says that we can actually add interest on a monthly basis and it will state what that interest amount is. Your assignment question is asking you for question 15 to produce an invoice and payment receipt template for your business startup and attach them here onto your ePortfolio. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook, pages 36 to 40, or use the internet for further research. And don't forget to include your company number if you have one, business logo, business name to incorporate on your template. You need to also include things like your payment terms, details of how to make payment, and if you want to include terms and conditions, feel free. Options for making and receiving payments. Cash. Still used in some businesses, such as retail businesses and taxi services, although electronic payments can be used for even small amounts now. So cash is becoming less important. For businesses, the disadvantage is that cash needs to be physically counted and taken to a bank. Large amounts of cash can also raise security issues for a business. Direct payments. Most bank accounts now allow customers to pay and receive amounts through online banking. The party making the payment simply needs a sort code and account number and can transfer a payment from their own bank account to the business or person they are paying. Debit cards. Debit cards are cards connected to a bank account that allow the user to pay for goods without ever having to draw cash. The card is swiped in a card machine by the business or held over the machine if using contactless technology and the payment is then taken from the cardholder's account and transferred to the business. This is usually done in real time, meaning the payment is instantaneous. 
If there are insufficient funds in the cardholder's account, the payment will be declined. Credit cards. Credit cards are used in the same way as debit cards, but are a form of lending. Instead of being linked to the cardholder's bank account, they have a borrowing limit. The payment will be allowed as long as the borrowing limit has not been reached. The cardholder then pays the credit card company an amount each back to pay back the borrowing. Payment services. Services such as PayPal and Apple Pay act as a sort of intermediary. They are connected to the individual's bank account and or to a credit card. When a payment is made, the business sees the money as being paid through PayPal or Apple Pay and does not see the individual's bank or card details. This offers some protection to the individual against electronic fraud because the number of organisations actually holding their bank details are limited. It is also convenient because the individual does not have to put in bank or card details every time they buy something, for example on a website. Paying by phone. Many banks now provide phone apps that allow customers to use their phone to pay instead of a debit card. This works in the same way as a contactless card. The information is sent from the phone to the payment machine and the money is taken from an individual's bank account. Providers such as Apple Pay also offer the ability to pay using a mobile phone. Checks. Checks used to be the main way to make payments out of a bank account without actually withdrawing cash. A check is basically a written and signed form asking the bank to make a payment on the individual's behalf to another bank of an individual or business. Whilst these checks have largely been replaced by electronic payment methods, some businesses still use checks. Checks used to need to be physically taken to the bank to be paid into an account, although many banks have now replaced this with a system where the check can be photographed and digitally transferred to the bank. Your assignment question is asking you for question 16 to describe options for making and receiving payments. And this can be contextualised to your business startup. And further reading can be found in your qualification handbook, pages 41 to 42, or use the internet for further research. Don't forget to upload your accompanying evidence onto the ePortfolio system. Uploaded evidence may consist of the following documents in addition to the completion of the assessment booklet. Case studies. Analysis of sample business taxation documents. A screenshot. Spreadsheet. Annotated cash flow forecast. And populated cash flow template. This concludes this session relating to your qualification. In your next presentation, we will be covering the following topics. Developing a business plan. You will have been sent by email a date and go-to meeting link for you to log on for the teaching session which accompanies this presentation. To get the most from your learning journey, please ensure you log on to this online session with your trainer. We hope that you found that this presentation was useful and we encourage you to use the unit handbooks which are accessible in PDF format from your portfolio to support your studies. If you have any questions, our remote assistance service where we can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com where your emails must be marked in the subject heading NCFE Business Startup and our two telephone numbers are there if you wish to give us a ring. Thank you for listening. As usual, we welcome your feedback. You can either contact us at learners at solutionsequinox.com or if you wish, you can leave a comment on our YouTube video channel.